Anne Marie Burr was born December the 14th, 1952. She disappeared August the 31st, 1961. She vanished under mysterious circumstances from her home in the north end section of Tacoma, Washington. Her disappearance made national headlines and received renewed attention when it was theorized that serial killer Ted Bundy, who lived in Tacoma as a teenager, might have been responsible for her abduction. Anne Marie was the first of four children born to middle-class Catholic family. She was raised in Tacoma alongside her three siblings. On the night of August the 30th, 1961, Anne went to sleep in an upstairs bedroom in the family's home. She shared the room with her three-year-old sister. At some point during the evening, Burr awoke her mother, Beverly, notifying her that her younger sister, who was recovering from a broken arm, was crying. After comforting the three-year-old, Beverly put both girls back to bed. At around 5.30 a.m. on August the 31st, the family realized that Anne Marie was no longer in her bedroom. Searches of the home revealed the front door had been left open, a living room window was slightly open, and the girl was nowhere to be found. Burr's disappearance sparked a significant manhunt, utilizing soldiers from nearby Fort Lewis as well as members of the National Guard. Though several, indiv several individuals were considered potential suspects in the years immediately following, nothing led to Burr's recovery. After Bundy was apprehended in 1978, he was considered a suspect when it was revealed that at the age of 14 in 1961, he lived near the Burr residence. He also delivered newspapers in the neighborhood where Burr lived and that Burr, the Burr home was very close to one of Ted Bundy's earlier childhood homes where his great uncle still lived. A size 6 shoe imprint was found outside the open living room window and some investigators believed this was consistent with a teenage perpetrator. After corresponding with Bundy prior to his 1989 execution, Burr's parents publicly stated, based on circumstantial evidence, they believed their daughter's remains may have been buried on the University of Puget Sound campus. In 2011, forensic testing of material evidence from the Burr crime scene yielded insignificant, intact DNA se sequences for comparison with Ted Bundy. As of 2023, Burr's whereabouts remain unknown. People in the comments are saying that Ted Bundy may have been a familiar face to the child, and the parents would always say she would not have gone with a stranger. Um, if he did deliver newspapers in that area, 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning is pretty normal time for someone to deliver newspapers. I don't, I'm not saying that he did that on that morning, but did Ted Bundy kidnap little Anne Marie Burr? This is from Medium. In, in 1961, Anne Marie Burr was a beautiful eight-year-old girl with golden blonde hair and hazel eyes. She vanished on August the 31st, 1961, and she has never been found. It pretty much goes on to tell the same story. The following morning at 5.30, her mother went to the girl's room and found Anne-Marie missing. There was no sign of a struggle. Although she had locked and chained the front door the night before, Anne-Marie's mother found the front door had been unlocked from the inside and was left partially opened. 
She also found that a living room window was slightly open. Now, they had left they had a window in the living room that was left slightly ajar for a TV antenna wire that they had run out of that window. Now, a backyard garden bench had been moved and was placed underneath that window. Anne-Marie's parents had heard the family dog barking that night but had dismissed any danger, thinking that a thunderstorm had frightened the dog. Anne-Marie's two brothers slept in the basement and had not been awakened. Anne-Marie's parents frantically searched the home, running through the house, opening doors, and looking under beds. They called the police. There was little evidence at the scene. When authorities arrived, they discovered a slight sneaker print outside the living room window, leading investigators to believe the kidnapper had entered through that window and had left through the open front door. There was little evidence at the scene to go on, aside from the shoe print, which investigators believed was a size 6 or 7 kid's sneaker, which is typically a shoe that a younger person would wear. They also found a strand of red thread stuck in the window jamb. The Burr's neighbors had reported seeing someone in their yard a couple of days earlier. See, I asked that question earlier, was he watching her? And even if it wasn't Ted Bundy and it was someone else, had they been watching her and, and waiting for a time? How did they know what room she slept in? Was it a family friend who had been inside the home and knew what room that each child slept in? Because if she was in an upstairs bedroom and they entered the home through the living room window, did she awaken and come down the stairs and they just saw an opportunity to take her? Or did they go up to that room specifically to get her? Anne-Marie's disappearance was classified as a kidnapping from the outset. It left police baffled. Investigators questioned known sex offenders in the area, but speculated Anne-Marie knew her abductor. I think so, too. I think it was someone from her neighborhood, regardless of whether it was Ted Bundy, and he knew her from where his uncle lived in the neighborhood, and he was there from time to time, and or maybe he had befriended her. Maybe he intentionally, you know, got to know her around the neighborhood just so she wouldn't be afraid. A month after her disappearance on September the 2nd, the Tacoma knew, well, that would only have been a couple of days if she went missing on the 31st of August. This would have only been a few days later. The Tacoma News Tribune reported intensive ongoing searches However, more than 50 years later, Anne-Marie remains missing. At age 14, noto notorious serial killer Ted Bundy lived only a few blocks away from Anne-Marie. No one suspected him at the time because he was only 14, and it would be years later before police would, you know, before he would begin becoming a suspect in the disappearances of these women, or murders. Early Warning Signs Bundy displayed disturbing behavior early on in his childhood. Stories emerged about anim animal mutilation, violence, and sexual deviancy. One story that Ted Bundy's aunt said that she had awoken from a nap to find three-year-old Ted Bundy had removed knives from the kitchen and placed them around her body while she was asleep. Around 1951, Bundy's mother, Louise, had brought him with her to Tacoma to be closer to Bundy's great-uncle, Jack. Jack was a music professor, and he was also Anne-Marie's piano teacher. So there's the link, and this is what led everyone to believe. This is how Ted Bundy would have known the child. This is how Ted Bundy would have come into contact with her at piano lessons. 
Bundy went to Mason Middle School and is said to have worked an early morning newspaper route at the time of Anne Marie's disappearance. However, authorities did not consider the teenager a person of interest at the time. A decade later, Anne Marie's relatives would tell authorities that Ted Bundy and Anne Marie knew each other and were friendly. She would not have been afraid of him. It was not until Bundy was arrested in the 1970s that Tacoma police began taking a closer look at his potential involvement in the kidnapping. Many believe Anne Marie was Ted Bundy's first victim. Well, that's possible. I would also look around the neighborhood or the area and see if any other children had gone missing or had been attacked in some way prior to this, but it's possible. Author Rebecca Morris. Bundy confessed to Anne Marie's abduction and murder during a prison interview with a college professor who was researching serial killers. For her book, Ted and Anne, The Mystery of a Missing Child and Her Neighbor, Ted Bundy, Morris spent four years researching Bundy's potential connection to Anne Marie. Throughout the years, investigators who spent time with the serial killer have said that Bundy would often talk in the third person and speak hypothetically when discussing how serial killers operate. Those who interviewed him over the years were confident he was speaking about his own crimes. But Bundy believed communicating in the third person shielded him from prosecution for crimes he had not admitted to. Add one digit. Bundy is believed to be responsible for killing 30 to 36 women but it is reported that Bundy once commented to a police officer, add one digit, meaning that he had killed over a hundred women. It is not out of the realm of possibility that Bundy began actively murdering people in the 1960s and not the 1970s. Bundy's attorney, John Henry Brown, agrees he reportedly wrote a memoir that details conversations with Bundy. Prior to his execution, Bundy had provided Brown with a signed release of attorney-client privilege. Brown, who may have known Bundy better than anyone, claims Bundy had told him about more than a hundred people that he had killed and not only women. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that because while most serial killers do have a type, and I've used this example before, Ted Bundy, of course, went after women who were around college age, early 20s, late teens, early 20s, and um, John Wayne Gacy went after young men, vulnerable men. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer, of course, we all know, went after young gay men who he would pick up in bars. And but but these serial killers, they they get this. And I'm no professional. I'm just you know going by what I've read and what I can see myself about it. They get this taste for killing. They get this desire. And if the person of their potential desire is not available to them, they will take an opportunity. Now, it would have been easy for Ted Bundy to start out practicing, as, and I hate to use that, but, you know, to hone his skills on children because children were easier targets, especially this young girl who knew him and would have, you know, not have been frightened if he came into her bedroom. In 1986, three years before Ted Bundy was executed, Anne Marie's mother, Beverly, wrote Bundy a heartbreaking letter. Dear Ted, on August the 31st, 1961, just before school was ready to start for you and for our children, 
there came a black rainy night with lots of heavy wind. You were about 15 and had been wandering the streets late at night, peeping in windows. I feel your first murder was my daughter, Anne-Marie Burr. The bench from the backyard was used to climb in the living room window. The orchard next door was a dark setting for a murder. What did you do with the tiny little body? God can forgive you. With all appeals likely to be refused, there is nothing left for you in this world. There can still be everything good for you in the next. Your life started going wrong somewhere when you were very young. There had to have been a lot of bad things happen to make you have such feelings of hatred. I came close to ruining my life because of my cruel actions and feeling no sorrow about them. A lot of strange circumstances brought me help or I would not have been able to find myself. Even though I knew I needed help, my actions were getting out of control. You should have received the same help when you needed it. If you can gather any strength you have left and try to feel a little sorrow for the horrors you have brought to so many, you will face these horrors alone if there is no chance to be with God after you die. You have nothing more to lose in this world. By explaining your sickness, you will feel sorrow and gain everything in the next life. Um, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to agree to disagree here. And I'm not here to become religious or discuss religion, but I just think that some things are unforgivable, even, you know, no matter how much you may ask for it. I don't know. Um, I think this woman is writing this letter hoping to appeal to Ted Bundy's human side, if he had any part of a human side. And maybe she was hoping that he would see that by her telling him that there was an opportunity for him to ask for forgiveness and to be forgiven... I think maybe she was really just hoping that he would fall on his sword and admit so that she would be able to find her daughter's body. I have not written until now because the end of life for you did not seem so near. Will you write, will you write back to me regarding Anne Marie? Ted Bundy replied to the letter in 1986 but never admitted to abducting the little girl. But both parents spent their lives haunted by questions. Anne-Marie's father died in 2003, followed by her mother in 2008. If Bundy was responsible for Anne-Marie's death and the death of approximately 70 other victims that have never been accounted for, then he took that answer to his grave. Bundy was executed January the 24th, 1989, and Anne-Marie's four siblings still wait for answers. In 2011, 50 years after Anne-Marie's disappearance, authorities submitted evidence to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab for DNA testing. Authorities had developed a DNA profile utilizing a vial of Bundy's blood. Several weeks later, they reported that the evidence gathered at the scene of Anne-Marie's disappearance did not contain enough DNA to pr produce a complete DNA profile. This was a dead end, but the investigation is not over. And here are some questions that were asked. Did Ted Bundy ever feel sorry for his actions? The answer, the respected FBI profile, profiler John Douglas described Ted Bundy as an obsessional killer who lacks empathy. I don't believe Ted Bundy had the ability to feel any remorse. Well, I don't think he did either. I mean, he was a sociopath. He had no ability to feel anything but self-pleasure and self-fulfillment. 
he didn't care about anyone else's feelings. He didn't feel any remorse. He would continue to be out there murdering people if he had been allowed to stay out of jail. If he had never been caught, he would have continued to murder people until his own death. Anne Marie's disappearance remains a mystery. Um, I have never heard that law enforcement has attempted to go in with cadaver dogs. So, that that's a question. I mean, I don't know anything about the length of time that a, dog, a cadaver dog could detect death after, uh, you know, decomposition. This would have been 62 years ago. So I don't know, you know, if bringing cadaver dogs in to search the area now, I don't, I mean, I would need to look that up and research that to see what the the possibility is. But maybe one day they'll never get any answers as to whether or not Ted Bundy, you know, abducted and murdered this child unless, of course, they do find remains. Would there even be any DNA left to take from the body at this point? I would wonder, and this is something that I looked up and couldn't find any answers to, but I would, I would wonder if the police ever asked the family of Ted Bundy to search their homes. We know that he had a great uncle who lived just down the street from this family. We know that his own family lived nearby there. And um, people return to places that are familiar to them. I would have wondered if the police, once the police kind of got the idea that Ted Bundy may have been involved in this, did they ask the families of the Ted Bundy's families, and even if the homes had been sold to someone else by that point, did they ask those homeowners to allow them to search, maybe to search and dig up the yards and stuff? When Anne-Marie Burr, age 8, vanishes from her Tacoma home in the wee hours of the morning of August 31st, 1961, it sparked a massive search and led police down a maze of dead ends. With very little physical evidence, no witnesses, no body, no credible ransom demand, and no known motive, the case eventually grew cold. More than 20 years later, convicted serial killer Ted Bundy allegedly claimed in a prison interview that he murdered Anne Marie when he was 14 years old. Now, did he admit it? They said that he would speak in the third party, in the, like in the third person, and he would be telling the story as though he were talking from the viewpoint of a serial killer, but not coming right out and saying, I, Ted Bundy, did this. It was Labor Day weekend, and the warm weather in the Pacific Northwest had turned muggy. Anne Marie's mother had spent the day getting her four children ready for the coming school year. Um, her daughter Anne, who was the oldest of the four children, was excited to start the third grade at Grant. The children spent the day playing with their friends in the neighborhood, and Anne was invited to sleep over at a friend's home. But her mother wanted her home as she prepared the children as she prepared the children for the school year. Their mother was tired from the warm weather and hadn't been sleeping well for a couple of weeks. The husband and wife had imagined that they heard noises in the yard that night. At about 11 p.m., they locked up the house and Dawn put Barney, the black cocker spaniel, on the landing between the kitchen and the back door. The chain was put on the front door and a living room window was left open a couple of inches so the wires to the TV antenna could go through. That evening, a rain drenched the city 
wind blew trees down and lights out, and neighborhoods were plunged into darkness. When Beverly woke up at 5.30 a.m., she went to check on the children. She first checked on the children in the basement. They were sleeping. Then she went upstairs to find Anne Marie's bed empty. She went back downstairs to see if maybe she had snuck down to the basement. She searched all around the living room and all around the house. She found the front door was standing cracked open. The latch was undone and the door stood ajar. In her bathrobe, Beverly went to several nearby houses knocking on doors, asking if anyone had seen Anne. She walked around the side of the house to find a garden stool had been placed beneath the open living room window. She awoke her husband and they called the police. They first of all thought maybe the child had been sleepwalking. I don't know that she could have gotten the chain open on the door. Maybe she could have reached it. Um, they set up phones in the home. The police set up phones in the home hoping that maybe a ransom demand would come from a kidnapper, but it never did. Beverly regretted that she didn't teach her children. This, this was something that she talked about later. She regretted that she didn't teach her children just how many people in the neighborhood had police records. It's very possible that it was someone else because once they started looking, they did find that there were some sex offenders in the area. Um, Anne's father said that he didn't trust some of his neighbors. There was a woman who lived down the street who had spent time in an insane asylum. There was a man who liked to sunbathe nude in the backyard. Um, and he would have the neighborhood children come over and give them candy. So, you know, there were a few other people in the area that could have been possible suspects. And... Um, Police thought that it was a possibility that there had been a mix-up because there was another man in the Tacoma area with the same name as Amory's father who had a lot of money, and they thought that it could be possible that they thought that um, they had mixed the two children, that they'd mixed the children up. He had a daughter about the same age as Amory named Deborah, and... He was going through a divorce with this with the child's mother. And um, they thought maybe it was a custody dispute that the mother had sent someone in there to take the child and that people got the two children mixed up. I don't know how much they dug into that. Here is something that was reported during the search. As soon as police arrived at the Burr home and interviewed Anne's parents and siblings, Don Burr and his brother Raleigh went to search the neighborhood. They examined construction sites near the University of Puget Sound, about two blocks from their home. There were seven campus buildings under construction that week, and there were deep ditches, and excavated sites. Near one building, the, the men saw a teenage boy kicking dirt into a ditch. They thought he had a smirk on his face. Don urged police to search the campus. He would never forget the face of the teenager standing watching them search for Ann. Police tried speaking with the little sister, Mary, who was only three years old and may have been believed to be the last person to see her sister, but the three-year-old was too young to articulate if she had seen anything or anyone, and she didn't remember. Detectives did kind of canvas the neighborhood for a few weeks, kind of hung around, see if anyone maybe came back to the scene of the crime. Um, they questioned thousands of people and gave lie detector tests to hundreds. It was the biggest manhunt in Tacoma history. 
The leading suspects included a teenage neighbor boy who had flirted with Anne and one of Anne's own cousins who grew up to be a convicted child molester. Complicating the search, there were no witnesses, little physical evidence, no vehicle description, no fingerprints, no ransom demand, no weapons, no body, and no motive. There was a scant footprint and a single red thread. That was all they had to go on. Um, the detectives did have another suspect three years later in 1964 an auto parts salesman from Spokane took a 10 year old little girl from Tacoma on a ride around the northwest in his Buick convertible she was dropped off a few days later the man shot himself as the FBI pounded on his door in 1965, a prison inmate in Oklahoma wrote to the Burrs. He claimed that he and a friend were picking beans on an Oregon farm and that they took Anne when they were in Tacoma looking for work. The Burrs gave the letter to the police, and in 1967, the prisoner was flown to Oregon and a crew dug in an Oregon field but found nothing. Ted Bundy's Ted Bundy first became known to Tacoma police as a peeping Tom and a shoplifter. This was around the time that he was 14. This was around the same time that this child went missing. After tests were performed on him in 1986, a psychologist concluded that Bundy lacked any core experience of care or nurturing. Well, of course not. Eleanor Cow began using her middle name Louise and married Johnny Bundy and raised four other children. By 1974, her firstborn was abducting, raping, and bludgeoning women to death, leaving their bodies in the mountains. Thirty-six murders were attributed to him, but an FBI agent says that there were probably at least 50 to 70 more. Uh, Bundy spent 11 years on death row. During that time, he did interviews with journalists, psychiatrists, and researchers. He told them a story about killing a young girl in an orchard. So I think, to conclude this video, I think it's probably very safe to say that Ted Bundy probably did kill this girl um, that same year, Bundy again told the story of the murder of a young girl to Dr. Ronald Holmes, an associate professor of criminal justice at the University of Louisville, who had a two-year grant to study serial killers. Bundy told Holmes that he stalked, strangled, and sexually mauled his first victim, an eight-year-old girl, who mysteriously vanished from her home 26 years earlier. His admission didn't make news until the next year, when Holmes presented a paper to a conference in Colorado. Bundy told Holmes that he had stashed the body of the child in a muddy pit, possibly near the University of Puget Sound. Some have discounted the account, but Holmes remained adamant about what Bundy had told him. Well, just to, you know, this turned into a much longer video than I intended. I really didn't intend to get into this whole thing about Ted Bundy, but I'll just say this. I believe Ted Bundy probably was involved in this girl's disappearance simply because of the fact that he had the opportunity um, he was in that neighborhood. He did have family right there. He would have had a, an opportunity. He knew the child, had been in contact with the child previously. And I believe the things that he told the police later about abducting and murdering this child were real. And the police, 
I don't think her body will ever be found because I do believe her father was right. And I believe that Ted Bundy did take her body and, and dump it into one of these ditches that was filled in and concreted over. And I believe the child's body probably is right where they, you know, suspected it was. And that's really all I have to say about this. This is one of the older um, cold cases of that area. And um, I, I know they can't definitely wrap it up and, and call it a solved case because there's no evidence, physical evidence of that. But I would say that that case was solved when Ted Bundy began to talk and when people began to put two and two together. Thanks for watching.